Uh, so now uh, we are coming to uh, our last speaker, uh, Xing Ming Chen. So uh, Xing Ming is a PhD candidate at UC Berkeley, uh, working with Professor Dong Song. Um, so her research led uh, at the intersection of deep learning, programming languages, and security. Uh, her recent research focuses on neural program synthesis and adversarial machine learning towards tackling the grand challenge of increasing the accessibility of programming to general users and enhancing the security and the trustworthy of machine learning algorithms. Uh, she, re she received uh, the Facebook Fellowship in 2020. So let's welcome Xing Ming. Um, please unmute yourself, Jimmy. It's probably on, on the top. Uh, there's a toolbar. Or... Yeah, uh, yeah. Can you see my screen? Okay. Yes. Okay, cool. No, good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Xin Yun Chen. I'm a PhD student at UC Berkeley, uh, working with Professor Dong Song. Uh, it is my great honor to share my recent work about neural program synthesis with all of you. So uh, nowadays, the state of the deep neural networks can um, perform pretty well on some standard classification and selection tasks, especially for image recognition and some natural language applications. However, so far, a deep neural network itself still cannot precisely perform numerical or logical reasoning. Therefore, in this talk, I will discuss my work on leveraging symbolic program synthesis techniques to empower the neural model with the capacity of compositional reasoning. In the first part of the talk, I will discuss our IKEA paper last year, where we incorporate a symbolic execution engine to synthesize programs from input output samples. And in this work, the program specification includes a few demonstrations of 2D grid word navigation. Then in the second part of the talk, I will discuss our IKEA spotlight paper this year, where we propose neural symbolic techniques for reading comprehension. So let's start with the first part of the talk about program synthesis from input samples. And we consider the Carroll domain. So in the previous uh, talk, uh, uh, Richard has provided a very nice introduction of the Carroll domain and the program setup of input output program synthesis. And now I would like to uh, go into more details about the, the uh, problem here. So basically, uh, for um, program synthesis from input examples, uh, we are provided with uh, several pairs of inputs and outputs, which means that uh, when we provide these inputs to the synthesized program, uh, its output should match what has been uh, specified here. Then these pairs of input output examples will be provided as the input to a neural model which synthesizes the program accordingly. Then, uh, as we can see, a Carroll program here uh, controls a robot in a 2D grid world so that it can reach the output state from the input state after execution. Then, to evaluate the correctness of the synthesized program, um, at least the synthesized program should uh, satisfy the input-output specification. And besides that, we also construct some uh, hurdle test cases uh, to see whether the generalized generated programs can still uh, generate the desired outputs in these cases. Then, as we can see from the Carroll program, uh, this language uh, in, uh, is not uh, completely uh, sequential. So basically, it uh, includes some uh, control flow constructs such as loops and conditionals, which uh, increases the complexity of this uh, grammar. Then, before we dive into the, our approach for input program synthesis, uh, let me uh, pro uh, provide a brief recap of existing uh, neural architecture for um, input program synthesis and see what are, what are missing there. So basically, uh, the model is provided with uh, k input pairs as the input. And usually, we consider k to be a small number, like for our Carroll task, k is equal to 5. Then in the neural network architecture, uh, we have an encoder to compute an embedding factor for each of the input pairs. Like for our Carroll task, we use a convolutional neural network to uh, embed the 2D grid words. Another part of a model input uh, is denoted as PT minus one, which is, the, uh, which is the program token generated in a previous time step. Then both parts of the input are fed into a language model as the decoder, 
which generates the next program token PT. Uh, so uh, basically, uh, this entire model generates the program in a token by token in a sequential way. Uh, so basically, uh, this uh, architecture is kind of a um, direct adaption of existing uh, encoder-decoder architectures for other uh, tasks such as image captioning or natural language generation. Then, uh, what could be the potential issues here? Uh, notice that during the entire program generation process, we always feed in the initial input-output pairs as the model input uh, without considering the uh, execution results of the program. Then let's look at a concrete example and see why this could uh, be suboptimal in some cases. Uh, suppose we want to synthesize uh, programs to satisfy these two input output pairs. So this problem is relatively easy and can be solved by a sequential program. Where the robot first puts a marker in its current cell, then moves towards its northwest direction. So at the first time step, the model should predict a put marker statement, which uh, puts a marker in the current cell. Then, after this prediction, somehow the grid's words uh, should be more similar to the uh, target output states. So, um, in, in some sense, the program specification is supposed to be changing over time. However, uh, uh, existing uh, neural uh, architectures for program synthesis don't take such state transition into account and still feeding the same improper pairs uh, throughout the time. In this way, the semantic meanings of the programs is not effectively leveraged by the synthesizer. Therefore, uh, we propose a technique called execution guiding neural program synthesis. So let's look at the same example of specification as shown in previous slides. Uh, at the beginning, the current state is still the initial input and the target state is the output. But this time, what after the model predicts a put marker statement, this statement is immediately executed and results in a new, uh, it results in a new state. Then basically uh, all these uh, intermediate execution states are used to, uh, to guide the subsequent synthesis of the programs. So basically the high level idea of our techniques is to view the, a program as a sequence of manipulations to transform each initial state into the final target state, which are specified by the input output pairs. Then from this perspective, um, when a partial program is generated, we can immediately execute it and obtain some intermediate execution states. And as we can see here, these uh, intermediate execution results provide a more fine-grained specification for the uh, program synthesis process. So uh, this is how our approach works to synthesize sequential programs. Then we extend our framework to synthesize programs with branches. So every time when the model predicts an if condition, we know that uh, this statement will have two branches, one for true and one for false. Then existing neural uh, synthesizer models um, uh, will treat such programs in the same way as uh, sequential programs, which means that all input output samples are provided as the input to the synthesizer, regardless of whether they satisfy the condition or not. However, intuitively, the synthesis of the true branch only depends on those uh, input states that satisfy the condition, and the synthesis of the first branch depends on the rest of the samples. Therefore, in our execution guided synthesis framework, Every time when the model predicts an if condition, uh, the model will immediately evaluate it on the input output samples and split them into two subsets, one for true and one for false branch. Then the two subsets are uh, fed into the synthesizers to uh, generate the true and first branches uh, uh, respectively. Then finally, um, these two branch, the uh, predictions of these two branches are merged together to uh, form a complete if statement. So in this way, uh, our synthesizer can uh, better utilize the semantic meaning of the programs. Uh, finally, let's see how can we uh, leverage our execution guided synthesis to generate programs with loops. Uh, for repeat loops, its semantics can be equivalently uh, represented using the loop unrolling technique. 
So the same technique for synthesizing sequential programs still applies here. Then, to synthesize the while loops, uh, an important observation is that uh, a while the meaning of a while statement doesn't change if we append it inside another if condition if statement with the same condition and body. For example, the this while statement while front is clear put marker move is equivalent to if front is clear put marker move uh, followed with the same while statement. Inspired by this observation. We can adapt our technique for synthesizing if statements to synthesize a while loops in this language. So basically, every time when we generate a while condition, we know that only those inputs that satisfy this condition will be relevant. Therefore, again, we evaluate a, the, the, this while condition on top of the improbable examples and select the subset that matches the condition, then generate the uh, body of the while loop uh, accordingly. Then, after the, model, the neural model emits an N token for the while loop, the execution of the entire loop terminates so that the model can go forward to synthesize the rest part of the programs. So uh, this execution guided synthesis technique is the main one we propose in this work. In addition, we also propose execution guided ensemble for program synthesis. So in particular, we make some adaptions on top of the standard ensemble technique so that it is aware of the semantic meanings of the programs. So basically, for most deep learning tasks, when we obtain different predictions of, uh, from uh, various models uh, without knowing the ground truth table, it is typically hard to tell which is the correct prediction we want. However, for program synthesis, we can take a simple sanity test by checking whether the synthesized program satisfy the input output examples. Then for ensemble, we can already filter out those predictions that uh, do, are not consistent with the specification. And notice that passing the input output uh, specification doesn't necessarily mean that the program can generalize to the herd out test cases, but at least, they are, uh, at least this is a very strong necessary condition. Then, to ensemble the remaining uh, predictions, we study uh, several variants of ensemble principles and we present the most effective two here. And actually, they are also pretty simple. The first principle is always uh, selecting the shortest program as the final prediction. The second method is to select the majority vote from the predictions, which uh, aligns well with the existing ensemble techniques. Then, here are the results. We compare with our work with Spano et al. Uh, actually, this is the same uh, um, model that has been introduced in Richard's talk. So basically, uh, this work applies exactly the same neural neural architecture as we described before, but it didn't apply our proposed uh, execution guided synthesis and ensemble techniques. And we refer to their approach as MLE here. And we evaluate uh, two matches. One is called exact match, which means that the prediction is exactly the same as the ground truth program. Another match is called generalization, which means that the prediction is not necessarily be the same as the ground truth program, but uh, still it can satisfy both the improper examples and the herd out test cases. Uh, we can observe that uh, each of our proposed techniques itself can significantly boost the performance over the baseline, regardless of whether it is trained with supervised learning or reinforcement learning. And in particular, by combining both of our proposed execution guided synthesis and ensemble techniques, our approach can improve the transition accuracy from 77% uh, to 92%, so which is a 15% performance gain. Then in the second part of the talk, I will discuss our latest work on neural symbolic reasoning for reading comprehension. And this is my internship project last year at Google Brain. So a reading comprehension has been a popular task for natural language understanding, where uh, given a question and passage as the input, the model needs to provide the answer to the question grounded on the passage. And as we can see from this example, uh, most answers to uh, um, the uh, questions in standard reading comprehension benchmarks come from a single span in the passage. Therefore, 
the state-of-the-art reading comprehension models are typically designed to support single-span extraction. Specifically, a language model such as BERT is used as the encoder to compute an embedding vector for each token in a question and passage. Then, there are several uh, fully connected layers on top of the encoder to compute a probability for each passage token and see whether it could be the start or end of the answer span. The ground truth answer spans are provided in a training set, uh, which could be used for uh, model supervision. And although such a framework looks pretty simple, actually these models work very well on standard reading comprehension benchmarks that mainly require single span extraction. And on some data sets, it even surpasses human performance, such as on squad. The main progress so far comes from the development of large scale pre-trained language models, such as uh, BERT, uh, more recently, uh, XLNet, uh, Robata, Airbird, etc. So at this point, perhaps a common thought among people is that good pre-trained language models are all you need for natural language processing. But is it really the case? Earlier last year, there was a data set called DROP, which is designed to emphasize discrete reasoning for reading comprehension. As you can see, some categories of questions clearly cannot be answered by existing span extraction-based models. For example, arithmetic questions require manipulating different numbers appeared in the paragraph. Counting questions require identifying all mentions of related entities from the paragraph. And the multi-span questions require including more than one span from the passage to form the final answer. Then compared to squad style reading comprehension benchmarks, DROP focuses more on numerical reasoning and also its answer formats are more diverse. Therefore, if we naively run BERT over the DROP dataset, the F1 score is lower than 33, which is clearly below human performance. So the main message I want to convey here is that pre-trained language models are definitely important, but not the only thing you need. To get a good performance on this data set, most existing work designs specialized modules to answer different types of questions in a job data set. So here, the reader component is an encoder to compute an embedding vector for passage and, and question. And typically it is designed in the same way as standard reading comprehension models. Then for answer generation, the model first uses the classification module to decide the type of answer that is required for the input question so that it can call a corresponding module to provide the prediction. So the concrete design of these modules can differ among different uh, work, but uh, basically the entire model is kind of a hack to achieve a good performance on this specific job data set. And this model is usually easy to train because uh, each module is formulated as multi-class classification with task-specific heuristics. However, such a model design does not support commissionality. For example, the span module cannot be easily called for more than once to support multi-span questions. And also, it is hard to generalize to different types of questions because different types of questions could require a different a module and heuristic design. Another way is to design a neural semantic parser to solve this task. So the idea here is that we need to use an external tool to pass the natural language text into a structured representation, uh, such as key value tables. Then we can, um, use, we can do a search process on top of this structured table to find those uh, programs that can lead to the ground truth answer so that we can train another neural semantic parser on top of this preprocessed version of the data set. The advantages of this kind of design is that it supports commissionality. And also, more advanced operators can be easily added into the domain-specific language. However, the main downside is that the performance is pretty poor. It is even much worse than a simple bird. The main reason is that the preprocessing step of parsing the text into structured representations is highly error-prone. For example, if we use the semantic row labeling tool to um, uh, find the ground truth programs, 
then typically it can only uh, search for around 35% of the training samples, uh, which uh, clearly limits the performance of the overall model. Uh, therefore, in this work, we propose a neural symbolic radar framework, what we call NERD, to, um, to like, uh, perform uh, advanced reasoning for reading comprehension. So compared to neural semantic parser described before, we get rid of the uh, parsing uh, step as a preprocessing step, so that our uh, reader, how our model still uh, directly manipulate only input passage and question, and we use the same encoder or the reader component as existing reading comprehension models. Um, here, we uh, in our implementation, we use the BERT model as our encoder. And a uh, different from previous was work, work on job, which uh, design like uh, different modules to to answer different types of questions. Here, we design a single programmer module, which is an LSTM with attention in our case, to synthesize a program in a sequential way, so that it will provide the answer to the input question after execution. Here, we show an example of counting problems in the job data set. So instead of directly generating a number as the final answer, as what has been done in previous work, in our NERD model, uh, it will generate a program to perform the counting. Notice that such programs are not included in the original job data set. And I will discuss how to train our model in this case later. By designing this uh, framework, our approach combines the distributed representations of the passage and question generated by the reader component and the symbolic representations of the prediction rationale generated by the programmer component. Then, two challenges emerge. The first challenge is how to directly manipulate over the input passage and question, which are unstructured. The second challenge is how to train our model with weak supervision, where no annotated ground truth program is available for training. So to solve the first challenge to, to bypass the structured parsing process, here's where our nerd's language comes in. The key design choice is that we introduce span selection operators as the basic operators to select the arguments so that other operators can be directly applied to the text by calling these span selection operators as their arguments. Here we show some sample programs of how to use our passage span and value operators to select the arguments for counting and sorting problems. The next uh, we need to uh, figure out how to train our model with uh, weak supervision, where we only have the ground truth answers, but we do not have the annotated programs that lead to the answer. There are two uh, issues related to this uh, challenge. The first issue is a spurious programs issue. Specifically, given a pair of question and answer, usually there could be multiple different programs that lead to the correct answer but in general, only one of them could be semantically correct. And without uh, any manual investigation, it is typically hard to figure out which is the one we want. The second issue is that the program search space could be exponentially large to provide a training supervision. Uh, usually to start our training process, we need to do an exhaustive search to find the uh, programs that lead to the ground truth answer. And it may be easier for span selection questions but it could be super hard for more advanced operators, such as count, counting and sorting. For example, for a counting problem, when provided with the ground truth answer, the only information we know is the number of spans that need to be included as the arguments to the, count, the operator, but we know nothing more, so we need to enumerate among all possible spans in the passage. Similarly, for sorting problems, we only know that the key value pairs should at least include the ground truth answer, but we don't know anything about other key value pairs to compare with. In this case, the number of possible span, uh, uh, spans and also the programs grows exponentially to the length of the passage, which is intractable given that the, usually our passage includes at least 200 words or so. To solve the spurious programs issue, we propose to train our model with hard expectation maximization with thresholding. Here, I will not go into the details of our training algorithm, but the basic idea is to train our model with problems with fewer spurious programs first, 
learn iteratively at those uh, uh, candidate programs that have a higher decoding probability than a certain threshold. Then uh, we also propose some data augmentation techniques that leverage the semantic uh, meanings of the operators in our language to train our model from code start. For example, you can manipulate existing span selection questions in the data set to generate some uh, training samples for counting operators so that the model can learn how to perform the counting without a uh, corresponding ground truth programs. Similarly, we can use existing entity extraction tools to construct some initial key value pairs, which makes our uh, program search space more tractable. Then, after each training iteration, we can also use the currently trained model to decode more programs for the future training stages. Then, here, uh, here are the results. We first show the results on a job data set and we compare with existing uh, neural network architectures that require specialized modules to answer different types of questions. And we can observe that our NERD model uh, outperforms uh, the other neural networks at the time of submission. Without, uh, uh, and also it can use a unified uh, decoder, which is the programmer, to answer all types of questions in the data set. So here I want to show some examples of predictions by our NERD model. As we can see, our model can better support the commercialinearity compared to the baseline models. And in particular, it naturally supports multi-span uh, predictions, which is the main reason why it could uh, perform substantially better than other baselines for the multi-span uh, question category. And then here we show some examples of the predictions for counting and sorting problems. And we can see that the model can um, predict the arguments for these operations pretty accurately, even if there's uh, no any uh, annotation for such kind of problems in the original data set. In addition, we uh, evaluate our model on mass QA, which is a benchmark of, that requires a more in-depth mathematical computations for reading comprehension. And it covers uh, uh, several mass domains, including geometry, physics, uh, profit gain, and probability. We show that without any change of the model architecture, uh, by um, extending our uh, domain-specific language to include more advanced mathematical operators, our NERD model significantly outperforms the state-of-the-art on mass QA, uh, which suggests its uh, flexibility and scalability of our design. So to conclude my talk, um, in here in this presentation, I discuss our recent work on neural program synthesis, uh, where we combine deep neural networks and symbolic program representation for complex reasoning. And we demonstrate that our um, techniques can uh, infer the programs from input specification for different domains uh, involving uh, either visual context or the natural language descriptions. And for future directions, we consider extending these techniques to con jointly consider visual and language specification as a pretty uh, promising direction. Then to improve the performance of the program synthesis models, effectively incorporating program semantic information provides a richer guidance for the synthesizer. For example, we demonstrate that leveraging intermediate execution results and semantic characteristics of the instructions is beneficial. Uh, finally, I would like to thank my advisor, Professor Downsome, and my collaborators of these projects uh, from Berkeley and Google Brain. And thank, thank you all. And I would like to take uh, some more questions. Thank you, Xinyi. It's been a really good um, presentation. And uh, so um, uh, we got some questions from the audience. So mm -hmm. the qu first question um, comes from uh, someone who said, uh, uh, he or she was just new to this field and trying to get more understanding of this domain. So um, uh, the uh, the um, he said, um, so um, I'm curious about how neural program synthesis differs from um, deep reinforcement learning in the sense that um, deep RL also tries to obtain a se like a sequence of actions to get to a target state from a starting state, which looks mm -hmm. very similar. Uh, as uh, especially compared with your uh, previous uh, work uh, and discussion on this Carol domain. Uh, so uh, maybe you can give us a more um, 
uh, detailed, you know, from your perspective, what, what do you think the, what's the connection and what's the difference between these two? Thank you. Sure. Uh, I think um, if we like only consider like this uh, programs that only include like sequential operations, then if we just view it as a action sequence, then it's kind of a pretty uh, similar to the RL domain if we want to do some like navigation task. But uh, there are two uh, main differences. One is that like, in, the pro in the program synthesis domain, usually um, uh, we will have uh, more constraints in terms of the syntactic and the semantic uh, meanings. Like for example, for the Carol or some, some more advanced programming languages, we have a control flow constructs. So we, uh, which uh, are not uh, very easy, can, cannot easily um, formulated as a se sequential generation process. So this is uh, one, one difference. Another difference is, is that um, for the RL um, domain, um, I, I think for RL domain, usually we, um, we will um, have a kind of a very, um, uh, a, a, pretty, a pretty like a specific, specific goal. Like uh, for example, we want to, uh, even if uh, there are multiple traces that lead to the lead, lead to the uh, final output, then usually, the, usually we will consider the, the shortest one to be optimal or something. But for program synthesis, uh, usually um, such kind of constraints are more in formulated in the like in the gram grammar in the, in the grammar space. Like for example, for the Carol, we will have we will uh, enforce that the same uh, program can like um, satisfy uh, multiple different improper pairs instead of just focusing on a, a specific improper pair. So I think uh, usually the main differences come from the like the like the grammar the semantic. Uh, space, the grammar constraints, and also uh, sometimes the goals can be different. But uh, clearly there, there is some connect, connection be between them. Okay, yeah, thank you. And uh, the other question uh, that I personally have actually mm -hmm. is that uh, when, you're, when you're talking about, you know, synthesizing algorithms to uh, accomplish a carrier domain task or to answer a specific question, you mentioned a lot about this, uh, how to re resolve these superior program problems. So mm -hmm. I, th I think in my understanding, this is partly because, because right now you are only, uh, the goal is to synthesize a program that can be executed to derive the answer specifically to the specific question. So if you are only having one uh, example, specifically one answer to the question, uh, then there can be many, many different programs that all, um, you know, all satisfy, uh, uh, the, uh, like that can, whose uh, execution result or uh, um, can satisfy the answer uh, you are given. So, um, and uh, how do you think um, you can uh, potentially extend this uh, idea, uh, like some of the idea you're describing, uh, to things as programs that can be uh, more general, uh, like, uh, uh, for example, uh, one uh, specific example I have is that in the in robotics domain, sometimes people talk about uh, uh, when you are trying to um, uh, put all the dishes into the dishwasher, so uh, one, one possible program is that you just uh, put one dish uh, into the dishwasher uh, at, a, at a step and then, and then at once, and then you, you stack many, many, uh, like a sequence of uh, this put dish into dishwasher uh, 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 comment in, into a single program, and then you can finally achieve this, uh, uh, this task. But uh, as human or like a, like a more uh, intelligent uh, learner, uh, we're expecting our uh, program to sense as programs with loops you know, so that probably it can generalize to more, um, a, a larger uh, number of scenarios where you may have more dishes, for example, or smaller uh, number of dishes. So mm -hmm. uh, how do you think uh, uh, some of your work or some of the idea can be extended to uh, work on this, you know, such kind of like a generalized um, program domain? Thank you. Yeah, sure. Um, so I think um, to like, uh, so for the for the scale scale this kind of technique so I can solve like more real world robust tasks. I think um like also related to the talks from previous speakers, I, it is pretty important to like um develop some like uh, subroutines or libraries for the um, to include them in the in the search space so that it is more checkable. Because if we learn everything from the all, all the primitive actions, then definitely the search space will like explode uh, when the task becomes more complicated. Then um, to learn this, um, definitely the, um, in terms of concrete techniques, then curriculum learning is definitely important so that we can like learn the learn these libraries from some uh, simple tasks first and then like extend more into like, more, more sequential or more con conversational tasks. And also uh, sometimes um, I, 
for if, if we have a very like um, concrete or specific domain, I think it's, it's also fine to include like some, some more human knowledge to uh, follow like structure our search space. Right, yeah, this reminds me of uh, a technical question that I had in my mind uh, regarding your, uh, regarding your, especially the first part of your talk, uh, where, mm -hmm. um, so when you are synthesizing multiple programs, uh, so what's the, what's the metric that you are using to rank them? It, are they just based on, you know, the program length or, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the, the likelihood produced by a neural network, or do you have any other types of more domain specific or domain independent uh, ranking functions for different candidate programs. Yeah, so I think uh, like in the, in the first part of the uh, talk, like for the Carol, uh, finally, when we do the ensemble, actually we, 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 tried, we tried different uh, variants, but in terms of like, uh, really the, the those like simplest two uh, metrics are the most effective. Like um, mm -hmm. the reason why the shortest, uh, so it is a kind of um, makes sense that usually if the program is, is too complicated, then it somehow may, may overfit two specific samples. But when the program is, is uh, both short and can generalize to, to many samples, then this one may be pretty good. Then mm -hmm. another thing is that uh, when we do not have the, this kind of input output specification, like for the natural language or some other uh, like, um, in, like uh, descriptions, then uh, I think uh, when we train the model somehow in an iterative or in, in a curricular learning setting, then the prediction probability of the model itself is actually also pretty informative. Like for the for our like reading comprehension task, we find that um, after we uh, like iterative train train the model, and when we use the 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 prediction, when we like kind of feeding the, the uh, candidate programs and get their probability, we can find that uh, those uh, programs that with very low probability are are actually could be potentially annotation errors or a kind of off. Then for the more programs with a higher probability, actually they are, they are indeed um, more likely to be the correct ones. So I think uh, both of both metrics are pre pretty helpful in this case. Mm 